subcategories and um, odd dimensional Lagrangian spheres. So thank you for the for the introduction. So I'm going to talk uh, something about Calabial structures and its applications in symplectic topology. Uh, so um, let me first talk about spherical objects. And in this talk, it will be a field. And, and for convenience, we assume that it's characteristic zero. Um, so C is a k-linear home finite triangulated category. So we can talk about spherical objects in this triangulated category, which means first, uh, its home space is like isomorphic to the cohomology of an n-dimensional sphere. And uh, also it satisfies Poincare duality. Uh, basically the second term means Poincare duality. Uh, so it's a question whether like any all-dimensional spherical object defines a non-trivial class in the grotendic group of this triangulated category. Uh, so I actually, I don't know how to formulate this question, so I formulated it in this, in this, in this quite general form. Uh, hopefully it makes sense. But if X is an even, even dimensional spherical object, of course, and if you look at its Euler form, this shows that it's a non-zero, defies a non-zero class in the Grotendieck group. Uh, but if it's all dimensional, it cannot be derived from, from taking the Euler form. But there is a related question in symplectic topology, uh, which is if you, take a two n-dimensional Weinstein manifold uh, with n being odd, and you have a Lagrangian sphere in this Weinstein manifold. And is it true that this Lagrangian sphere has non-zero homology class uh, with, with zero coefficients in this homology with zero coefficients? Of course, if n is even, it takes a self-intersection number. Uh, it's some uh, up to psi, it's still the Euler form. Uh, this shows that this, this homology class is not only zero, but also primitive. Um, in fact, the general conjecture by Ali Ashberg, which is somehow a consequence of the regular Lagrangian conjecture, which says that um, for any close exact Lagrangian some manifold with Spanish Maslow class, um, its homogeneous class should be primitive. Um, but it's in general, it's not know, it's not know how to prove this even for, for example, all dimensional spheres and uh, like uh, exact Lagrangian torus. So how these previous two questions are like rigorously related to each other, maybe not so rigorous, but at least we have to find some relationships between uh, the non-triviality in the homogeneous group and the non-triviality in the crotendic group. Uh, so this involves uh, taking into consideration the Foucault categories because the Foucault category is something relates the concrete geometry, commutative, commutative geometry, and somehow non-commutative aspects of symplectic geometry. Uh, so if we look at the Weinstein manifold and we assume it has vanishing first chain class so that everything is degraded, then we can associate with two A infinite categories. Um, the first one is the compact Foucault category, Foucault category of closed exact Lagrangian submanifolds. And another one is the rack Foucault category, which involves not only closed Lagrangian submanifolds, but also certain non compact Lagrangian submanifolds. If you think about wasting manifold, then of course it has a handle body composition, and you can consider the Lagrangian co cores associated to critical handles and these give you an, a set of objects in the red Foucault category. And actually, according to uh, Ganache, Apart, and Schender and um, some other group of, of people, they have proved that these Lagrangian co cores actually generate the red Foucault category. Uh, but it's not clear um, what kind of structure this compact Foucault category should have for general wasting manifold. Uh, so there is a map a homomorphism constructed by Lazareff recently. And he shows that there is a subjective map from the n-dimensional, middle-dimensional cohomology to the grotendic group of the red Foucault category. Um, the non-trivial part is that this map is actually subjective. And uh, in certain cases, for example, when this compact Foucault category and red Foucault category are related by A-infinite duality, that makes this uh, 
relationship precise later in, in this talk. But uh, actually by saying that they're related by a infinite pursuit duality, I mean something uh, quite strict, uh, which means you should have a set of generating objects in this uh, compact category. And of course you have Lagrangian co-cause here. And you require that these generating set of objects uh, to like intersect uh, the Lagrangian co-cause in a way that uh, um, they are somehow mutually dual to each other, which means if you pick an object, pick a generating object in the compact for car category, it intersects one of the Lagrangian co-cause at a unique point. Because with this assumption, you can uh, make use of the Euler form to show that uh, in the case when these two somehow for car categories are casual duals and this brought these protonic groups are dual to each other. Therefore, in this case, you should expect uh, by dualizing this map, you should expect an injective map from the protonic group of the compact Foucault category to the middle dimensional homology. Uh, so if you can show that uh, an all dimensional spherical object defines a non-trivial class in the protonic group, it means uh, it necessarily has non-zero uh, homology class in the middle dimensional homology. Um, so what do I mean by kazoo duality? So what I mean is that you have a version of kazoo duality for augmented unit or infinite algebras. Um, this means that um, you can take the bar construction of this because you, it's augmented. You can uh, take a bar, which is the augmentation ideal, the kernel of the augmentation, and define this its bar construction. And you, it's a, it's a co-algebra an infinite co-algebra. And if you take the linear dual of this bar construction, you get a, an infinite algebra because you also have the inclusion of a copy of K inside this infinite co-algebra. Uh, this kazoo dual A shrink is also an augmented A infinite algebra. Uh, so you have two augmented A infinite algebras and they are kazoo dual if you uh, take the double dual of this augmented A infinite algebra, it gives the augmented A infinite algebra itself. Uh, so in this sense, uh, these two infinite algebras are, are so dual. Um, a, a simplest example is you, you take the smooth compact manifold Q and you look at the co-chains on the base manifold and you look at chains on the, on the base root space. And if Q is simply connected, I mean, you can always like look at the kazoo dual of this um, DG algebra of chains on the base root space and it will give you the, the uh, up to quasi isomorphism co chains on the base root space. Um, but in the case when Q is simply connected, if you take the double dual, which means you take the bar construction of this infinite algebra and take linear dual, you could recover the chains on the base root space. Um, so this is Adam's, Adam's theorem. Um, of course, this discussion can be generalized to the case for. A infinite algebra is not over field, but actually over semi-simple ring, which means you take a finite copy, direct product of a finite copy of your field K, and you obtain a infinite algebra over semi-simple ring. Um, because uh, like in most of the cases, in most of the cases we know, um, these two categories generally by finitely many objects. Therefore, their endomorphism algebras can be identified with an A infinite algebra with same simple ring. That's why it makes sense to talk about causal duality between these two Foucault categories. Um, so another example, so previously we have seen example from, uh, from topology, but another example from algebra is you, you look at uh, uh, quiver algebras. Um, for a, a finite quiver with potential W, you can associate with two color BR infinite algebras, but they have different color structures. The first one is defined by conservative Sopman. And it's a proper color algebra, which means its home spaces are finite dimensional. Um, and the proper color structure basically means up to quasi isomorphism, the, the A infinity structure on this uh, A infinity algebra is, is cyclic. Um, because I have assumed this field K to have characteristics here. So this, this A infinity algebra is defined by, basically the home spaces are defined by taking into account of the, of the arrows 
Um, and the, the infinite structures are defined by uh, the derivative of this super potential. And there is kazoo dual construction, which probably most of the people are familiar, more familiar with this kazoo dual construction due to Ginsburg, because this construction is actually earlier. Um, so it, it constructs a DG algebra in terms of a quiver Q with, with potential. Um, the underlying algebra is, is generated by arrows and reverse arrows and loops associated to vertices. And the differential is determined by the super potential of this algebra. Um, and, and it is a well known fact that actually, by saying that these two are so dual, I actually need a completion. So, completed Ginsburg DG algebra. Sorry, this is a typo. Um, and this infinite algebra, cyclic infinite algebra defined by Komsevich Solomon, are uh, Kazoo dual. So, for the simplest example, you take here Q. Uh, to be just, uh, for example, a sphere of dimension three, uh, then what you get uh, in this case is a quadratic algebra, and this is a polynomial ring. So this is a usual version of kazoo duality uh, between uh, exterior algebra and polynomial algebra. Uh, in this case, if you uh, just take Q to be a single vertex and without potential, uh, this is just to the same DG algebras here. Okay, so well, this is a simplest example. Of course, you should have in mind certain plumbings of cotangent bundles of spheres. Um, and, and we will encounter these examples later. Um, so, so there are actually many examples of six dimensional Weinstein manifolds. Um, whose Foucault categories can be identified respectively with these two versions of A infinity and DG algebras. And these manifolds will be called quiver threefolds. And these quiver threefolds, I think, uh, it was like studied before by, by Ivan Smith and he, he studied many of these examples. But I should say why restrict here to the case of dimension three. Uh, so this is because it's, a, it's the simplest non-trivial dimension of a, um, uh, all dimensional, I mean, a Weinstein manifold with all the complex dimension. Uh, but you can generalize all these notions to higher dimensions. Uh, there are higher dimensional analogs of Ginsburg DG algebra. So of course, there are higher dimensional analogs of this uh, Kumsevich Solomon A infinity algebra. Um, um, but let's just look at this, this simplest case for now. Um, so, there are many examples of these quiver threefolds. Uh, for example, simplest of them are just plumbings of pretending bound of S3s according to an arbitrary tree, gamma. And these are shown to, to be quiver threefolds in a paper by Eckholm and Lakili. And there are also plumbings because this plumbing is like you take two pretending bound of S3 and uh, you plumb them at, at a point. So the so, so core Lagrangian spheres, so for example, if you plumb two quaternion bundle of S3 together, uh, you identify the fiber and base directions of these two S3s. Then these two Lagrangian spheres will intersect a unique point. But you could also think about plumbings of these two S3s along an unknotted circle. And these examples are studied recently by Smith and Wemist. And the quiver, with potential correspond to this, these manifolds are just a two cycle quiver, which means you have two weighted vertices. And there's an arrow from vertex A to vertex B, and there is a, a somehow reversed arrow from vertex B, B to vertex A. And there is a super potential. So if we you denote these two arrows by X, Y, the super potential is given by um, nth power of X, Y. So there are these quivers with potentials and they correspond to these Weinstein manifolds. And there are also these examples, which are six, we see six manifolds, but they're mu fibers of, of one stabilizations of the hypersurface cusp singularities, um, which means these kind of singularities studied previously by Keating. And they are somehow the next non-trivial singularities compared to the, to the ADE type singularities um, because they have modality one. Uh, and if you take the stabilization of the singularity, which means you add a, add a projectic term. So 
now it's become xp plus yq plus z squared plus ax yz plus w squared equals zero and you take the immunal fibers and i i have shown that these immunal fibers are equivalent three folds because both of the Foucault categories can be identified with quiver algebra with the compact Foucault category being identified with the conceptual solvent a infinity algebra and the, the wrapped Foucault category being identified with the Ginsburg DG algebra. Um, this A is a complex number and you can take this A to be one if the sum is less than one and A can be taken to be zero if the sum is equal to one. Um, there are also quasi projective color of three folds associated with projective differentials and these are studied previously by Ivan Smith in his paper quiver algebra with uh, quiver algebra for car categories and he computed the, the stability conditions on, on certain for car categories. But once you take care of that for these manifolds, you need to twist by a by non-trivial background class in, in H2. Um, the reason is that if you don't twist, there are some unwanted objects in your in your totally unobstructed for car category, which basically means for car category of exact Lagrangians. But in this case, it's somehow quasi projective, not uh, so these manifolds are not exact, but somehow um, it is ex expected that if you can associate a wrapped uh, Foucault category to these quasi-projective Calabria three folds, uh, these wrapped Foucault categories should be identified with a complete Ginsburg algebra. Um, so these are some examples of quiver three folds. There are, there are a lot of other examples. Um, so this shows that uh, um, there is a relationship between somehow representation of quivers with, with Foucault categories. Um, so we can replace the previous question. Remember that we have previous asked whether any all dimensional spherical object in a triangulated category defines a non-trivial class in the Grotendi group. Um, but if we simply ask this question for derived categories of uh, on triangular categories, which are derived categories of modules over these Ginsburg algebras, it is still a difficult, difficult question. I mean, in general, you, you don't know for Ginsburg algebra you take its derived category of perfect modules, uh, whether any spherical objects in this Ginsburg algebra uh, should correspond to a non-trivial class in the Grotendi group. This is in general unknown. Um, so if we Sorry, there is a question. Um, slide to confuse about completion. Yeah, sorry, uh, just because you know that you took formal completion of the Ginsburg algebra, but yes. the wrapped to chi category is not really a formally completed structure, right? Yes, it's, I uh, know, but uh, in all the examples I talked about, the Ginsburg algebra is actually complete. Meaning that the Ginsburg algebra and the completed one are the same, or? It's the same, quasi isomorphic. So I, completion, I completion doesn't matter. Yeah, completion doesn't matter. So it, it's kind of, so I have to say that for this duality, you need complete Ginsburg algebra, but but in all these examples, the, the Ginsburg algebra itself complete. I, I, I don't think like if you have a non-complete non -complete Ginsburg algebra, I don't know whether if you have a non-complete -com Ginsburg algebra, you can actually identify the rep for card category. With, with it? I think probably no. Okay. Um, so, so we can restrict to some, some special cases and uh, because even, I mean, when the triangular category is some derived category over, over, over Ginsburg algebra, it's still difficult to un answer. So we can look at the cases when for example, there is a bigrading on the on the Ginsburg algebra. So if you have a bigrading, uh, it basically means you have a because I mean Ginsburg algebra is kind of kazoo dual to the conservative solvent infinity algebra. But if you have a bigrading on the Ginsburg algebra, it naturally induces bigrading on the conservative solvent infinity algebra. And if you have a bigrading, you should think what you should think about is a C star action, um, because C star action is essentially equivalent to a to a bigrading. Um, so somehow Outside of consists C star action on, on Foucault categories, uh, which means you have a representation of this C star uh, on the on each graded piece of the morphism space. And 
Um, you want all the A infinity structures to be C star, C star invariant. Uh, so the, this means the C star action only for Kai category. And, and you want to, you can see non trivial C star actions. So Silo introduced the notion of a dilating C star action, which means if you look at this C star action on the morphism space of a single Lagrangian brain, uh, of course, you, you need an equivalent Lagrangian brain. In general, general object in the Foucault category is not equivalent. Um, but it's dilating if it's C star action on, on the top degree of this cohomology of, of this Lagrangian brain has weight one. Uh, because if you have C star actions, dilating C star actions, you can, of course, you, when you have C star actions, you can consider this equivalent Mukai pairing, which means you take the Euler characteristic of each graded piece, this K is the weight of the C star action. And you take the Euler characteristic of this graded piece and you form a power series, um, a Laurent, which is a Laurent polynomial. And this gives you the equivalent Mukai pairing. But for this equivalent Mukai pairing to be interesting, you have to assume that this action is, is dilating. Um, in this case, you can, of course, consider the equivalent Grotendi group. Um, and you can show, because you have this equivalent Mukai pairing, that uh, all dimensional spherical objects define non trivial class in the, in the equivalent Grotendi group. And then you can try to use this uh, forgetful map and you tensor with this uh, simple module C, which means you set Q to be one. Um, you can consider this forgetful map, and by studying this map, you can, in many cases, you can prove that uh, an all dimensional spherical object defines a non trivial class in, in case zero. So, this works, for example, in the cases where your manifold M is a plumbing of a uh, cotangent bundle of spheres, for example, according to a tree. Uh, I think this works for, for tree plumbing case, but uh, for more general cases, it's not true because uh, not every Ginsburg DG algebra has a compatible Adam grading. Um, very few of them, them have, for example, if there is no, no, no superpotential, of course, you can, you can defy a, a by grading. But in general, this is not true. Um, so if you have a dilating C star action, of course, it, it induces somehow an infinitesimal, an infinitesimal level C star action, which is a non-commutative vector field. And this thing satisfies, so if you have a dilating C star action, and then you, it induces a vector field, non-commutative vector field, and uh, it's satisfied on the BV operator because this, this, I have assumed C1 to be zero. So this compact car category has a proper Calabial structure. And of course, then this Calabial structure induces a BV operator on, on the first Hochschild, uh, sorry, on, on the Hochschild cohomology. margin. And this class should satisfy this. Uh, so this H is a non invertible element in, in HH zero degree zero for the whole module of the compact for car category. Um, but if you have in mind the quiver threefold, uh, because both of the car category are identified with quiver algebra, then of course you have Kazoo duality. Um, then you have this isomorphism as BV algebras between Hock Chiyo cohomologies. Um, and this thing is further identified with, because it's, it's Smooth Calabial wrapped for car category. I will mention this, this notion of Calabial structure on a smooth category later. Uh, but then, of course, a class in HH0 induces a class in HH minus N. Um, if you know that the identity in this HH minus N defines basically the weak smooth Calabial structure on this wrapped for car category, then, of course, uh, this invertible element. Remember that this thing is just HH zero of the wrapped for car category. Uh, this invertible element defines a change of Calabial structures because it's a isomorphism, automorphism of the diagonal by module. Um, so this condition can be interpreted as the weak smooth Calabial structure on the wrapped for car category in the image um, of the composition of these two maps. So first you have this, so you know that we have this IBM long exact sequence relating Hock Chiyot and cyclic homologies. And these are, are the maps from the, the long exact sequence, but uh, somehow this I and B are like composed in a, a non-trivial order. So once they compose together, you have this BV operator. But this means that when you have a smooth Calabial structure here, it can be lifted to a, to a somehow a class in HH minus N plus one of the wrapped car category. 
Uh, this is somehow a restrictive condition posed on the calabial structures on the Weinstein on the replica category of Weinstein manifold. Uh, of course, this is not true for, as I said, for most of the previous three folds. Uh, because for certain Ginsburg algebras, you can somehow compute these functional homologies, and in some cases, this thing vanishes, and you know that it's it's never possible. Uh, so let me talk about somehow. Of course, it's a from this interpretation of a of a dilating C stacking which induces the class in HH1. It's natural to ask whether it's possible to replace this strong restriction on the smooth Calabial structure by a slightly weaker one, uh, namely the, the somehow the Calabial structure here all lifts to a class in in cyclic positive cyclic homology instead of the uh, Hochschild homology. Well, this is the notion of an exact Calabial structure, I think, first, first conceived by, by Komsevich and, and Keller. Um, so if we have a homologically smooth same infinite category, uh, which is n Calabial, this means that there is a Hochschild co-cycle uh, inside HH minus n. Oh, sorry, I should say that this minus n is because we, we use a somehow Cohomological grading. This is to match the grading on, on symplectic cohomology. Usually in algebra, people use HHN. So, so since I use somehow different grading, Calabial structures all appear on HH minus N. Um, uh, this induces a bimodular isomorphism. Uh, so this is a diagonal bimodular. This AE is A tensor with the opposite of A, uh, shifted by degree N, shifted down by degree N, and it's isomorphic, of course, isomorphic to the to the diagonal bimodular. So this is the definition of a, of a, I should say, a weak smooth Calabial structure. And this Calabial structure is, is strictly smooth if it can be lifted to a, to a negative cyclic cycle in, the negative, in this negative cyclic homology. And it is called exact if it can further be lifted to the, to the positive cyclic homology, which, is, uh, which means uh, Calabial structure is an image of this map B, which is Combs map. So we have this commutative diagram. Uh, we have this commutative diagram, which uh, factorizes this, this B into first a map from positive cyclic homology to the negative cyclic homology. And then there is a, somehow the inclusion of homotopy fixed points, which um, induces a map from, from negative cyclic homology to the to the Hochschild homology. Um, from this, we can see that if if a Calabial structure is exact, then it, it's of course smooth. But if it's smooth, then it's not necessarily exact. Or you can think of this thing as a like top degree differential form, and this is a top degree closed differential, sorry, holomorphic volume form. And this thing is like a, a a exact holomorphic volume form. If you realize this, this Combs operator as a as a Durham differential. Um, so an interesting fact is that any Ginzburg algebra, complete Ginzburg algebra, is in fact exact Calabial. But uh, you can actually there are actually more general class of of TG algebras which are defined by superpotential, which are called superpotential algebras. And those algebras are somehow more general than Ginsburg DG algebras, but because they, they allow somehow localization on the on the path algebra of quiver. In Ginsburg algebra, the underlying algebra is, is the path algebra of quiver. Um, and then you have differential determined by superpotential. But superpotential algebras are those that which allow localizations of the quiver, path algebra of quiver, and the differential is still determined by superpotential. As simplest example, you have the Laurent polynomial algebra. And more generally, you have uh, somehow the, the, I mean, if you have in mind the, the example studied in mirror symmetry, which is C2 minus a conic. And then that manifold is basically, it's, it's um, all the information is like local uh, concentrating degree zero. So basically, it's a polynomial ring, which is polynomial algebra quotient by the ideal form by x, y minus one. So that example is also a, a, a exact Calabial, al Calabial algebra. Um, so 
So let me give a geometric interpretation of these um, exact Calabial structures. It's, this uses a cyclic open closed stream map constructed by Shioganatra. Um, so the usual open closed stream map relates the Hochschild homology of the Raptor category with the symplectic homology. So here CH is a Hochschild chain complex and SC is a symplectic co chain complex. Um, but I have a dagger notation here because um, actually one needs to consider non unit of Hochschild chain complex. The reason is that if we consider usual Hochschild chain complex because this Raptor category is not strictly unital, um, then there is. Uh, it's, it's like difficult to construct, a, difficult to realize this Hochschild chain complex as a, as a strict S1 complex, uh, which means you have an S1 action on this complex. And uh, uh, this S1 complex is, is, S1 action is like mm, determined by somehow the, the differential and the BV operator and all the higher structures vanish. Uh, in general, this is not possible. Um, that's why you need to replace the usual complex by this non unital complex. And Ganache shows that this map admits a cyclic refinement. Um, but on the right hand side, um, you tensor with this somehow negative powers of U. Um, and this computes a positive S1 equivariance in platic cohomology, which is not the equivariance in platic cohomology which people are most familiar with. Uh, because usually people look at positive powers, but the, the construction is almost the same. Namely, you have like BV operator, you have higher order BV operator, and the differential equivalent differential is you take the differential plus um, U times the BV operator and plus U, U squared times the second order BV operator, and there is an infinite sequence of this sum. And the left hand side, computes the uh, cyclic homology of this rapid Foucault category. And this is a chain map. Uh, it respects S1 complex structures on both sides. So it de descends to a map on, on cohomology. Um, so we'll denote this version of equivariance in platic cohomology by, by this, this notation. Um, so if you, for example, if your M is a point, it's just uh, this uh, ring, coefficient ring. Um, so it's an easy consequence of, of this the existence of this cyclic closed open map that uh, if you have a Weinstein manifold um, and its raptor car category is color BL, then it happens if and only if there is a class in the first degree equivalent symplectic homology such that its image on the marking map is an invertible element in the degree zero symplectic homology. So this invertible in the sense that there is pair of pants product on a symplectic cohomology and SH0 is a algebra, so you can talk about invertible elements. Um, so this class will be called a cyclic dilation. There are related notions introduced previously by Saito Solomon. Um, they looked at exactly the, the they looked at a notion which is related to, related to a dilating C star action. And uh, it's a, uh, they look at class inside the first degree symplectic homology instead of equivariant symplectic homology. And this class satisfies this condition. And I should say basically it means there is a class in SH1 so that its image on the BV operator is an invertible element because you can always rescale this, this class by an invertible element in SH0. But this is the same equation uh, which appears here, so this non-commutative vector field, deformation vector field, which appears here, which comes from the dilating C star action. Um, so it's not strange that uh, if you consider the closed open map, um, then this class B goes to a non-commutative vector field, and this vector field satisfies the dilating C star action condition. Um, but it's not uh, somehow a more general notion because I mean, it's more although it's defined on infinitesimal level, you look at non-commutative vector fields instead of actually integrating these vector fields to, to these actions. It's, it's actually not a more general notion, basically, because this closed open map is in general not, a, not an isomorphism. 
Um, so there are there are classes here which could potentially correspond to interesting non-commutative vector fields, but then they, they do not come geometrically from the symplectic cohomology. Another property is that if you look at the erasing map, sorry, I should have said that this marking map correspond to the to this cones map. So if you uh, you know that this cyclic homology can be interpreted via the Ganacha's cyclic open closed stream map as the equivariant symplectic homology. And this thing can be interpreted as symplectic homology. You know that there is this, this map induced by Combs map. But this map also, I call it, sorry, I call it marking map because it's a map um, comes from string topology. In string topology, if you look at the equivariant homology of the of the free loop space. And uh, there, then there is a marking map which corresponds to put a marked point on your loop. Then you get a map from the equivalent homology to the usual homology of the, of the free loop space. Uh, so the same is true for this erasing map. It's of course induced by a map in comes along exact sequence if you interpret everything geometrically as symplectic homology. Uh, but it also comes from uh, it's also a map already known in string topology, which basically means you erase the marked point, then you get a map from the usual homology of free loop space to the equivalent homology of, of the free loop space. So if you look at this map, um, and if you look at the image of a quasi dilation on this map, it becomes a cyclic dilation. So it basically says that the, the cyclic dilation condition is weaker than quasi dilation. Every quasi dilation is cyclic dilation, but the reverse is not true. Um, so let me talk a little bit about symplectic capacities because this notion is also related to symplectic capacities. Um, you know, in, in gut touching is defined for any little bout or may uh, a symplectic capacity, a sequence of symplectic capacities. Uh, basically what you do is that um, you look at whether this identity and uh, the plus of powers U of this identity. So remember that we have a, this U comes from the coefficient ring, coefficient here. And this U is a formal variable of degree plus two, as in the usual definition of any version of equivalence in plenty homology. Um, basically what they looked at is this U minus K plus one times the identities E is the identity in the usual symplectic co-chain complex, the usual complex computes the usual symplectic co-margin. And say, they looked at whether it's going to be a, a co-boundary. And in many cases, for example, if you look at the identity uh, in the usual symplectic co co-chain complex, but if you regard this identity as, a, as an element in the equivalent symplectic co co-chain complex, sometimes it becomes a co-boundary. So if it becomes a co-boundary, it means that C1 GH, which means the first gut touching capacity is finite. But you can multiply this identity by powers of U so that you get the sequence of this, these symplectic capacities. Um, so M admits a cyclic dilation with H equals one. Remember that H is, a, H is an invertible element here. So H equals one in the special case of a cyclic dilation. Um, so if, if we are in this special case, it means that the first gut touching capacity is, is finite. Um, of course, you can ask, what about all the gut touching capacities are finite? Then it leads to a notion of a higher dilation, which was considered previous in the, in the PhD thesis of Jing Zhao. And she studies those higher symplectic capacities that behave on the left chest vibrations. Uh, this notion of cyclic dilation also behaves well on the left chest vibration, but I'm not going to talk about this property here. Um, so the reason why I want to talk about these capacities is because I want to talk about this, this definition called property H, uh, which was introduced by Seidel previously when, when dealing with the dilation. Basically means you want the geometry of this cyclic dilation to be sufficiently simple. So this means that you have a real number lambda, which is very small, smaller than the peer, than, than the smallest number in the period spectrum of the, of your uh, of your contact boundary. Um, then, if you take the flow cohomology uh, with the Hamiltonian of this slope, small slope lambda at infinity, 
you still get the usual whole merge of your manifold M. Uh, and you require that this cyclic dilation appears very early. It appears at two times slope, two times lambda. But this is the S1 equivariant flow cohort merge defined by Hamiltonian with slope two lambda at infinity. And this is a somehow a more general notion of the previously, previously met notion, this equivariant symplectic cohort merge. Because if you take the direct limit of this direct system built by equivalent flow cohomologies, then you will, will get equivalent symplectic cohomologies. There are continuation maps. Um, if you have a Hamiltonian which is of smaller slope, and if you have Hamiltonian with larger slope, then you can build a continuation map. And of course, in this case, continuation maps also can, can consist of like higher order contributions, um, which basically defy by counting one parameter family of cylinders with additional marked points, which can constitutes the parameter space. And you can build these continuation maps, which makes these Hamiltonian flow cohomology groups uh, a directed system. If you take direct limit, you get equivalent simplet cohomology. Uh, this cyclic dilation notion is that it's saying that this, this thing appears at a pretty small slope, or in the case where h equals y, it means the first data capacity is kind of sufficiently small not sufficiently small in the sense it's like sufficiently close to zero, but I mean, sufficiently small. I mean, it's it's in the sense that, uh, I mean, it's uh, smaller than a certain number, but uh, of course it's, it's larger than, than a certain positive number because if you, it's too small, it's impossible for you to have a cyclic dilation here because this class is not somehow topological. If it's topological class, it won't have non-trivial behavior on the on the marking map. Um, so this is about this, this property H, what does it mean? Um, so essentially it means uh, the capacity is, is small. But of course you have possibilities when this H is not equal to one. In those situations, I don't know how to interpret, interpret this condition. Um, the theorem I want to talk about is that if you have a two n-dimensional Weinstein manifold then n is larger than equal to three and it's odd, um, and if M satisfies property H, then for any Lagrangian sphere, its homology class is, is non trivial. Um, so there are a lot of examples of these manifolds. Um, according to a paper of Zheng Yi Zhou, um, the alpha hype surfaces inside CM plus one defined by this equation with the same power K, they have property H uh, because somehow he used the, the technique in the Diogo Lisi paper. So he could like write down the um, higher BV operators and show that there is a cyclic dilation there. Uh, but this cyclic dilation appears fairly early, appears as the smallest possible, possible slope. Sorry. And it is expected to be true for all these Milner fibers, these Milner fibers associated with Briscombe singularity with the sum of these inverse of powers being larger than one. Um, but it's not restricted to those examples. For example, you have certain lower color BL surfaces which also satisfy this condition. Uh, your inequality is wrong way around, k less than or equal to n. Which, which equality? So you, you said it holds if the degree is sufficiently high, is that right? I'm just talking about the, yeah. Oh, um, sorry, it's sufficiently low. Yeah, it's K less than or equal to N, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's the other way around, sorry. Thank you, thank you for pointing out. Um, so it's it's k less than or equal to n. Sorry. So I otherwise contradicts with this condition here. Uh, so you, you should have like sufficiently low degree hype surfaces. Mm, otherwise, I mean, intuitively, we won't have this finite gut touching capacity because it's finite. It means basically you have somehow low degree hype surface, something very close to C n or, or four or something like that. Um, so. Let me talk about some parametrized flow theory, um, which means you have an exact Lagrangian submanifold. 
uh, then you can define somehow the fitable transfer map from the symplectic co-chain complex to the to the um, chains on the base free loop space. Uh, I have assumed that yes, I have assumed this area is spin, and this map also admits an S one equivariant enhancement, and this is this is due to uh, Cohen Ganatra. Um, so also there is dagger here because this is not the usual uh, usual DG algebra of of, of um, chains on the free loop space, but it's actually a quotient, like quasi-isomorphic quotient, to make it a strict S one complex. So you can define this map, and these maps are defined by um, somehow it consists of an infinite sum of um, these maps of different orders. Um, and the domain of these maps is, is looks like this, um, because you this is a circle and, and this circle is inside air, which means a, a loop on air. And there are there is an interior puncture which receives this generator in the symplectic homology. And because you have to define higher order maps, so you have this you know, additional marked points, and they are allowed to vary, but only in this ordered way. Uh, now, if you look at the case when, you know, there is a new boundary straighten because of these additional marked points, um, which means this marked point P1, which is closest to the boundary, it actually goes to the boundary. Now, if you only have one marked point, you have this P1 goes to the boundary, and this asymptotic marker, it requires to point to the closest point to this interior puncture. So when there is only one marked point, it points to P1, when P, this P1 goes to the boundary. Um, now this asymptotic mark is allowed to vary. Basically, it, it somehow contributes the BV operator here, which is given by rotating the, which is given by the, the loop rotation. So that's why it somehow preserves the S1 structures here. And what about the S1 structure here, where if this P1 uh, somehow converges with this puncture. Of course, in P2 and P3 are forced to converge to this puncture. And then you get a sphere bubble with three marked points. And this sphere bubble is two punctures, the two punctures on this sphere bubble. And it's exactly the, the domain defining the uh, third order BV operator. So, so this is a simple explanation why this map preserves the S1 complex structure on, on both sides. And there is a simple application, of course, of, of this Schellebach Glasschef map, which is also a reinterpretation of an old result due to Davison. Um, namely, if M is a Liouville manifold, which admits a cyclic dilation, that does not contain any hyperbolic Zeta Lagrangian sum manifold. And if this cyclic dilation also has a property that is the marking map from the equivalent symplectic homology to degree zero usual symplectic homology hits the identities, then M does not contain the Zeta Lagrangian. K by one. So this generalize is a, a this generalizes an old result by um, I think Seidel and Solomon. Um, so for example, you know that all these examples they don't have exact Lagrangian torus. So the reason why I want to talk about this is that there is a more general notion, which is uh, this uh, S one equivariant enhancement of the total functoriality. Um, so this is also consists of a sequence of maps, BK uh, shrink. Um, but this map can actually be realized as an equivalent continuation map. And this is, this is not difficult to understand because when you're doing usual flow theory, you can realize this. Of course, the Viterbo from original construction of Viterbo from Torel is, is you, you look at the quotient complex and there is a map to the quotient com complex. And if you want equivalent ones, you, you have to prove that this quotient preserves the somehow S1 complex structures. Uh, but it can also be defined in terms of a, of a continuation map, which means by counting one pyramid families of, of uh, marked cylinders. Uh, but the, the point is that we want to look at the somehow, we want to restrict this cyclic dilation to a local neighborhood of an all dimensional Lagrangian sphere. And it turns out that if we restrict to this local neighborhood, all the higher order terms vanish, and you get something at, at degree one symplectic co-chain complex. I mean, all the all the things with 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 non-trivial powers of U will vanish. Um, so this is a 
chain level representative of a cyclic dilation, uh, which means this beta k um, lies in 2k plus one degree of the usual flow cold chain complex, symplectic cold chain complex. And you make up this, this degree issue by using the minus k power of u, which has degree minus 2k. So in general, this one lies in degree one equivalent symplectic cold mode. The result is that if you restrict this cyclic dilation to a wasting neighborhood of Lagrangian sphere, it turns out that this thing is a non-scalar multiple of a dilation, in particular, all the higher order terms will vanish. Um, so let me talk about parameterized closed open maps, because if you want to prove somehow the non-trivial uh, uh, Lagrangian, all dimensional Lagrangian sphere is non-trivial, we have to construct some, some endomorphism. And when this endomorphism acts on the flow cohomology group of this Lagrangian sphere, it gives you some, some non-trivial thing when you are, you are taking the super trace. Uh, it, it's non-vanishing, unlike the usual L characteristics, or L characteristic which, which vanishes. That's why we want to construct endomorphism on flow cohomology groups. Um, and how to construct this endomorphism is you need to use closed open maps. Um, and the most trivial one is that you look at you look at this previous considered disk, and exactly you're using the same domain, but this, this input set in interior puncture is re replaced by output. Then in this case, you will, can, you will, will get cold chain in this, in this usual flow complex. Uh, but actually, if case is zero, we will get a flow cold cycle, but if K is not, it's in general not a flow cold cycle. Um, of course, you can add like boundary punctures add boundary punctures to this disk, and then you will get a sequence of these closed open maps. Uh, it's just a basic usual closed open map, but now you decrease the degree by 2k. So that's why there is 2k here. Um, the domains of these things are just given by this one, because now there are boundary punctures. So I don't want these mark points to go to the boundary. So I want them to restrict in, a, in the neighborhood of this interior puncture. And then, of course, this asymptotic mark also points to the closest points to this puncture. And uh, these boundary components have Lagrangian levels. Exactly the usual definition of closed open map, but now with um, these parameters, auxiliary mark points representing the parameters. Um, so, this is a condition you need to satisfy by these auxiliary marked points. Uh, so, the consequence is that if you consider Close open map defined by uh, this domain with one interior puncture and one boundary puncture, then this thing is cohomologous to the result of uh, restricting this basically cyclic dilation to the uh, Weinstein neighborhood of an all dimensional Lagrangian sphere. I mean, this area is all dimensional Lagrangian sphere. And they apply the usual open closed stream map. But these two are cohomologous. This result is proved by the generation of domain argument. You can imagine that this thing, uh, you can consider one parameter family of these surfaces. And uh, as a limit of this one parameter family, there is a sphere bubble, a cylinder with several marked points. And this cylinder is equipped with uh, the one parameter cylinder. And it's, it's equipped with the flow data of, uh, of an equivalent continuation map. Um, so since this thing is a chain map, this thing is a co-cycle, you know that this thing defines a co-cycle in CF1 of L. But areas of all dimensional Lagrangian sphere. So we can choose a co boundary so that this thing is because this is a co boundary, and you can, we can choose a co chain in degree zero flow co mod so that you apply mu one of this co chain, you get this, this co cycle in, in CF1 of, a, of an all dimensional Lagrangian sphere. Uh, so if you, if you look at this pairing, uh, formed by all, like, all dimensional Lagrangian sphere and this degree zero core boundary, we can define endomorphism on the flow cold chain complex. Um, so this endomorphism is defined in the usual way, um, exactly as this was conceived previously by Saito Solomon. The only difference is that you replace this thing by a, by a higher degree thing. But remember that uh, we have previously considered this, the generation of domain argument, which is also applicable to this map. Um, the consequence is that uh, this is a chain map and uh, it's cohomology level map acts trivially on degree zero flow cohomology and multiplies by a, by a non-zero multiple on the degree n flow cohomology. 
So if you can see the true super trace of this endomorphism, it still traces somehow a, a non-zero number, which shows that this the endomorphism constructed via this cyclic dilation actually detects all dimensional Lagrangian sphere. So in order to prove that this Lagrangian sphere, I mean, we have already shown that this cyclic dilation de detects this Lagrangian sphere. The only thing we need to do is to relate this thing to the to the usual ordinary topology. So this thing is proved by somehow an annulus argument. Uh, so previous Sidon and Solomon can, uh, so, sorry, Sidon can see this, this, the generation of this annulus, which is a real blow up of some KSV space. And he proves that like certain relations that satisfies the, by the boundary component of, of this modulus space, a two parameter family of this annulus. In our case, there are additional marked points. So there are additional complexity coming from when one of these marked points goes to the boundary. Uh, but somehow in the case when these two air, I mean, these two boundary components have the same labelings, you can expect to have some canceling while this, while, when, when this marked point goes to the boundary. Uh, so basically, that's why how you can, you can prove this, this relations. And once this is proved, you can show that uh, uh, because this lambda is by our assumption sufficiently small. So we can show that actually if you project this thing to this, this somehow double of the flow complex, if you project to this HF with slope minus lambda, it defies a non-trivial homology class, Poincare dual of a non-trivial homology class. So this is how we can interpret this non-vanishing of the super trace into a like non-trivialness of the, of the homology class. Uh, so so let, me, let me skip this, which basically says that how where it's a, uh, so, so let me basically let me say, because I, I only have like three minutes left, let me say a few words about the existence of the, of the cyclic dilations or the existence of somehow exact calabial structures on the rap for cat category. Uh, so what I want to say is that we have this very beautiful, beautiful theorem due to Vandenberg, which says that if you have a homologically smooth complete DG algebra, which is concentrating in non-positive degrees, uh, then this DG algebra is exact club Yaw is equivalent to the fact that it's kazoo deal is a somehow proper A infinity algebra, which up to course has morphism carries this minimal cyclic A infinity structure, which is exactly the case for the for the compact for category of a Leuven manifold with vanishing position class. So we can apply this very beautiful theorem due to Vandenberg to, to the somehow the endomorphism algebra of flux ranging co-cause in the rack for category of a Weinstein manifold. And what we get is that we can show a lot of actually a lot of Weinstein manifolds has this um, cyclic dilation property or this rep for car category is exactly one of those examples you take the plumbing of any simply connecting manifolds according to a tree and another example is this milner fiber of a threefold triple point and of course you can you can do the same thing for more complicated examples it's just a the key point is you need to check this grading condition, namely this grading supporting non-positive degrees. Once this is checked, everything should, should be done. Sorry. Um, so, but this grading condition, if you think of, in terms of kazoo duality, it could be interpreted as a, as a grading condition if you have in mind somehow the, some wasting manifolds with somehow expect, e e explicit co-cause which you expect to split generate the compact for category, then this grading condition should be just a condition imposed on somehow the, the gradings of the Lagrangian spheres. I mean, you have somehow a bunch of Lagrangian vanishing cycles and you want to show that the grading of these vanishing cycles, I mean, the grading of the, the flow code chain complex of these vanishing cycles can be arranged so that as a, a supporting degree zero to, to N. So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of examples which satisfy this property. For example, those quiver straightforwards considered by Ivan Smith. And of course, so these like mu no fibers of straightforward, straightforward triple point. And they have an explicit configuration of vanishing cycles, which is determined by um, Smith and Thomas, which is which is shown in this very beautiful picture. So every every arc is a Lagrangian sphere, and they intersect in this way. And these blue arcs, so these three blue arcs are disjoint from this 
there are these three horizontal blue arcs, and there are nine red Lagrangian spheres, which intersect both intersect two of the Lagrangian spheres, colored in blue. And there is this final that there is this special one, which is B gamma gamma. And there are altogether 16 vanishing cycles. So it's complicated, but not too complicated. But if you think about this example, um, then you are going to get like 24 vanishing cycles, which is more complicated. But this method is like uh, can be used to show that basically all the all the briscombe mional fibers of briscombe singularity satisfying this condition should carry a cyclic dilation, or its replica category should be exact color BL. It's just a matter of, of checking the gradings. And if you are willing to do like complicated like checking, then of course it's it's doable. So let me stop here. Thanks very much, Kim. Um, so does anyone have uh, questions for you? Uh, may I ask questions? Yes. So if we go beyond this um, little bit domain cases, I think there's an example that Lagrangian spheres is uh, trivial because it's displaceable. Do you have yes. any candidates uh, of the conditions that this kind of things, uh, non-triviality holds? In a non kind of non exact cases? Um, I, I, non exact case, mm, I don't, I don't know. I uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't. So for example, if you consider this um, uh, left shift five relation, there are a lot of vanishing cycles. That yes, are Lagrangian yes. spheres, right? So yes. I just wonder that how much they, they, they became a non-trivial object or not. And maybe it's, it's, it's not so much uh, the problem you're, you're interested in, but. I, I'm uh, interested. Hmm. So there was there was a question in the in the chat, Kenji, to, to please clarify which oh. which example you mean you, you had in mind. I mean you have uh, just some uh, projective algebraic variety and you take this left sheet vibrations. And then in the most no, point, no, no the, the the example of the null homologous Lagrangian sphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean uh, I think this uh, there are some some so, something which came from this uh, conifold transition. In certain case of this uh, conifold transition type of this uh, toric threefold, then after this transition, you have this uh, S3. And uh, I, I learned this that, that in some cases that is displaceable. Maybe I interrupted you when you were saying something, Kenji. No, 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 I didn't. Yeah, I just said that. Ah, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, I just I'm interested in how much one can generalize this kind of story to the. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much interested to find some non-trivial object, and the Lagrangian sphere is a good, good possibility, but. To... Any other questions that anyone has? Okay, if not, maybe uh, let's thank you again for the nice talk. Thank you. It's just me. <laughs> me. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, I'll see you again uh, in 25 minutes. Yep. Well, well. <laughs>